Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming out. It is so great to be here. Thank you, Fan. Thank you, Lonnie, who I hope I can get to take home with me to New York. I mean, amazing. Um, it is so, so good to be here today. And I just wanted to say, as a native New Yorker, originally from Queens, um, and living in Manhattan, the heart of the city right now, I have to say that Chicago is so wonderful, I'm ready to move. Not just for fan, let's hear it for Chicago. Um, but also for, I, I was at a bookstore today, uh, signing my books, because there's an expression, a signed book is a sold book. And I went to a bookstore, and they were saying, welcome, oh, we're so glad to have you. And then we're talking, and an older woman came in, and the salesperson said, can I help you? And she said, oh, no, I'm just waiting for the bus. She's like, can I bring you a chair? And I'm like, I am not in New York City anymore. This is pretty amazing. Um, so research shows that parents talk to their kids about sex, drugs, and alcohol more than they talk about money. And the truth is, money is really one of those last taboo topics. It makes us feel uncomfortable. We think maybe we don't know enough. Maybe we're a little ashamed about how little we know or how we managed our credit card debt at some point or still are managing it or not managing it. And we're afraid that maybe we'll pass along information to our kids that isn't really all that right. Um, we avoid talking about money. I've been writing about this for 25 years, and I actually told Lonnie the truth. I've been writing about this for 30 years, but it sounds so long <laughs> that I didn't want to say it, but I've been writing about this for 30 years. Um, and like Lonnie said, I think the, well, the two highlights of my career were one, I got to teach Elmo about money on Sesame Street, which was one of the first uh, uh, introductions I had to talking to kids about money, young kids about money. Um, and then when I worked for the president on his council, um, when we put together these lessons, we researched the best research out there and said, what are the three things, four things kids need to know from age three to five, six to 10, 11 to 13, up through college. Um, and when I got to present it to the president, he's like, hmm, I have two daughters. That, that looks pretty good. So they were very, there was an outpouring of interest in this topic which frankly surprised me, um, the fact that people were so eager and so hungry for this information. Um, I have three kids. Uh, one is 21, one is 18, and one is 13. And as a mom, I think uh, walking around the playgrounds or the classrooms, or now college campuses, uh, I find that parents, when they hear what I do, they, they have a question, they have a burning question. Uh, and I've been starting my book tour. This is my second city. The first was Atlanta. And I'm going to 12 others. And so what I wanted to do was sort of pull together the questions I've been hearing the most uh, just in the last few cities and on interviews. So I put together the top eight questions. Um, these are uh, more, there are many more in my book, but I wanted to start with these eight. So let me just grab some water. And we'll begin. And when we're done, I'm most I'm interested, I'm interested in your questions. So first off, what age should you talk, start talking to your kid about money? Research shows, actually, I talked to a parent whose kid goes to University of Wisconsin. Well, they have an amazing behavioral economics department. And research shows that kids by the age of three, understand some really basic money concepts. They understand exchange. You give money for something, you get something back. They also understand the concept of value. Things have value. And by age seven, Cambridge University found that children are somewhat fixed in many of the key money behaviors. So that's a little terrifying if you have a child who's eight and up. But the good news is there are so many entry points to talk about money. Um, my editor of this book, uh, John Karp, editor of Simon & Schuster, he told me after he read the book, 
the next day, he happened to be going to buy a car. And he said, I would never bring my 11-year-old Lucy to buy a car with me, to go to a car dealership, how boring it would be. But he said he brought her, and he found himself discussing with her interest rates and what kind of loan he wanted to get and how he was going to you know, try to negotiate on the price. And he said it really dawned on him this was such a learning opportunity. Or if you're making a donation um, to an organization, to a school, to any group that you feel good about, uh, the United Nations Foundation and University of Indiana found that parents who talk to their kids about their donations end up with kids. They studied these kids, and six years later, they looked at the group, and the parents who talked the fact was their kids were much more charitable than the parents who did give but didn't talk about it with their kids. So the talking is something that we're going to be coming back to a bit today. Um, Terry Moffitt of Duke University did a very good study about this notion of how to start and when to start. And one of the biggest lessons, I think, one of the hardest lessons as a parent is saying no to your kid. And she has a whole discussion about impulse control. And when you go to the checkout line and your kid says, I want that, I, can I please have that? It's gum, it's Shopkins, it's Legos, it's Pokemon, all these things that they want. And her research showed that saying no to your child is beneficial, obviously. But what she found was that the parents who said yes repeatedly and their kids didn't build up that impulse control muscle, those kids were more likely to go on to college and have bigger debt loads as adults, in college and as adults. So saying no is something that's hard as a parent, for sure, but the research shows that it actually has a very strong impact on our kids. The second question is traits. What trait matters the most for money? And the answer is waiting. When, with younger kids, we wait for the swings. You have to wait in the playground for swings. You have to wait for your birthday. As grown-ups, we have to wait for vacations. I was just explaining to someone that we used to have to wait until the Wizard of Oz would come on once a year. Does anyone remember that? <laughs> or the Sound of Music it was once a year, and you had to be there at the right moment. My kids couldn't understand what that meant. Kids today don't have to wait. And it's important to teach them to, and talk about the importance of waiting and waiting and saving up for the things that we really, really want. So the marshmallow experiment. I'm sure some of you have heard about, but there, was this, there is a professor uh, at Columbia University, but he was at Stanford in the 1970s. And what he did was he took a bunch of cute little five-year-olds and he put them in a room and he said, I'm going to give you each one marshmallow. And I'll be back. And if you don't eat that first marshmallow, when I come back and I see it's still there, I'm going to give you a second marshmallow. And so he walked out of the room. The researchers walked out of the room. And then they watched behind a mirror. I don't want to give these kids nightmares, but this was just an experiment that doesn't happen often. But they watched behind this two-way mirror. And they saw some kids, as soon as they walked out of the room, the researchers walked out of the room, the kids shoved the marshmallows in their mouth. Like, ah, so excited to eat the marshmallow. But other kids waited. And they waited, and they waited, and they did all kinds of interesting things to delay from eating that first marshmallow because they knew they would be getting a second marshmallow. And what they found, and, and Walter Michelle followed these kids through 50 years. They're actually just turning 50 now. And he found that the kids who waited just 15 minutes for that second marshmallow had 200 points higher SAT scores on average. They had lower body mass indexes. And they had happier relationships. So it's pretty astonishing, the idea of waiting and saving and anticipating something that will happen in the future. It's a very difficult thing to do. Um, a study at University of Pennsylvania, it was a personality study of people 50. And they found 
that your ability to stick to long-term goals and for wait for something you want resulted in $250,000 more in savings for those people whose personality scored at that level of you're able to delay gratification and wait for goal. And finally, I think the most important point of all of this is there are ways to talk about and teach with your teacher kids about delayed gratification. And the interesting thing about the marshmallow experiment, it wasn't that those kids were so into self-denial or they had this great moral fortitude. It was that they had the ability to, in their mind, see that marshmallow, but pretend it wasn't there, or pretend it had dirt on it, or pretend it was really just a picture of a marshmallow. They had this executive function skill that is something that we know we can talk and teach our children. Uh, the University of Rochester did a study about two years ago to follow up on the marshmallow experiment. And what they did was they did a similar experiment where they gave kids art supplies. And they said, we'll be back in a little bit to give you new art supplies, better art supplies. So for half the group, they came back, the reliable researcher gave the kids the art supplies. But the second group, the researchers never came back, which is, and then eventually when they did come back, they're like, sorry, we don't have the art supplies. They tested that group again with snacks, <laughs> not Marshall's this time, I think it was M&M's. And they found that the kids who had the reliable researchers who came back and gave them something, rewarded them for saving, those kids did much better on that M&M test. They were able to wait for more M&Ms. And obviously, it's clear that confidence that you're gonna get something in the future, that saving today will lead to something good in the future is really important. And that really comes down to the consistency that we have as parents, a very hard thing to do. So, waiting. One of the best ways to make little kids wait is save for a goal and talk about opportunity costs. You don't have to use that term, but the idea that every day after school, if we go for a snack and it costs a dollar, instead of getting that snack, we're gonna put that dollar in a jar. And we're gonna put that jar in the kitchen. And every time we don't have a snack that day, we go home and have a snack, we put that dollar we didn't spend in the jar. And that money builds up and that is the money we can use to buy the things that we want. Compound interest is another great, wonderful gift you get from waiting. Compound interest is basically just, you have money and it gets interest, then the next year that interest gets interest, and the next year and it's, that interest on interest gets interest, and it grows exponentially. And giving a kid an example, using numbers we know, helps. Even if a kid isn't interested in math, you say, you know what? If you save 25 cents a day, starting at age 10, that money was invested. By the time you're ready to stop working, you'd have $50,000 just from a quarter a day. And finally, matching is something parents can do. Uh, someone was telling me here earlier that they have a matching plan with their child, and it's a great incentivizer for saying, every dollar you save, I'll put in 50 cents or a dollar. Kids really respond to that type of thing. And it makes that waiting maybe a little bit easier. All right, question three, allowance. Everybody wants to know what's the deal with allowance. I have been talking about this and hearing about it for literally 30 years. Um, I think there's no topic that, you know, for a lot of parents that really stresses them out. They're like, ah, oh, we started an allowance system in January and then we forgot to give it to our kids by February and then our kids forgot to ask and it was, sort of a mess. I think that talking, um, looking at that, I, did, I looked into about a dozen studies that were done, and they were international. And the bottom line with allowance, whether they were done in the US or done, that there is no right answer. Allowance is, doesn't really matter whether you give a set allowance to your child or not. For example, in Canada they did a study and they found, yes, giving allowance to a child ended up instilling responsibility in your child. But then a study in British Columbia showed giving allowance to your child, no, is bad because it caused them to be entitled. So the bottom line there is 
giving allowance isn't a gold standard. It's not the holy grail of being a personal finance, great personal finance parent. But it really does matter, first off, if you decide you do want to give allowance, and there's nothing wrong with it, it's just not the absolute end all and be all. If you do want to give allowance, the sort of general rule of thumb, and you probably heard this, is give your kids age, although a lot of parents bristle at that one because if your kid is you know, 10 years old, you're talking about giving them $520 a year. That, that sounds like we all would like you know, someone to hand us $520 a year. But if you decide to give half of that, whatever, the most important thing with allowance is make sure you follow the five Cs. You want to give cash to your kids. There are a lot of apps and websites. And the problem is if you're sort of transferring funds from your account to your kid's account, they don't see it. They don't really understand what's going on. You want to be clear. And that really comes down to what is that money going to be used for? And that's the hard part with allowance, right? So if you give your kid very little money, they really can't buy all that much today. And for parents, it feels, it's a funny feeling to say, yeah, I'm going to give my kid $10 a week. Like I said, it's all, it feels like a lot of money to be handing over. But if you do give allowance, you also want to be consistent. That's the third C. Stick to what you say. It is such a hard thing. Um, recently, uh, my daughter, we put her on a particularly strict, clear budget when she entered college uh, last year. And we told her, OK, this is your money. This is the money you can use for eating out, trips with friends. This is your own money. And she uh, was going skiing with a group of friends and said she looked into a flight. It was from New York to Canada. And the flight was $400 more than the train. And it ended up being a 12-hour train ride. And I said to my husband, how are we going to have her sit on a train for 12 hours? But we did. And she said, you know what? That was worth the $400. Because I'm going to use that $400 for something else that I want, for going out with her friends. And I think those kind of consistencies as parent, it's hard to stick with it, but the research shows it matters. Finally, control. As a parent, you get to decide, I don't want my kids to have candy, or maybe I don't want them to have toy guns, or whatever it is that you say. But beyond that, it's important to give them some control so they feel like this allowance is their money. And finally, chores. The research shows don't tie allowance to chores. When um, University of Minnesota did a study, they found that giving kids chores at very young ages, five, six, it had a, quite an impact on a lot of financial milestones. Kids were more likely to graduate from school or even start careers when they had that experience of having chores. But when you tie it to money, it takes away the intrinsic value of working hard on something as a team player, as a family member. And so tying allowance to chores, at least according to the research shows, it is not a good idea. Um, the other problem, of course, is if you tie allowance to chores, your kids start negotiating. Uh, all right, I want $3 to make my bed. Or uh, they might decide, you know, it's not worth it to get $5 a week to pick up my dirty clothes or put the dishes in the dishwasher. So tying allowance to chores is one of those ones that it just is not a good idea. And grades, bribing for grades, uh, or giving money for grades. Half of parents do that. I was really interested in hearing that. And I remember when my son, we were in, he was in seventh grade, and I could talk about him because I'm here in Chicago. He's in New York. He doesn't know what I'm talking about. And he, his seventh, he was having trouble, seventh grade, it was hard to get motivated to do his work. And his teacher, who we liked very much, said to my husband and me, you know, you might want to consider bribing him. <laughs> We're like, really? And the research, there's a wonderful researcher, uh, Roland Fryer uh, from Harvard, who did a huge study looking at thousands of kids and found that giving or offering money for grades 50 bucks if you get an A, doesn't work. It does not improve the GPAs of kids at all. He did these amazing randomized controlled studies. So that's one to, to definitely keep in mind. Um, and so money, 
uh, allowance. And then the next one I want to talk about, four, was college. So a lot of parents feel, understandably, I have two in college, very stressed out by the process, about the idea of paying for college, of the unknown of what it's going to cost. And first off, research has found that when you have children, young children, and you tell them you're saving, you have money earmarked specifically for their college, those kids are more likely to go on to college. And it doesn't matter how much money you have in the account, as it turns out. Just the idea of knowing they have money in their account is, in an, is a inspirational uh, notion that this is going to be money to be used for my college. Um, and telling kids the fact that going to college, and starting talking about this young, going to college means on average you will earn 300, from 300000 to a million dollars more over your lifetime. And that's an important message to get out there. Now we have Mark Zuckerberg and Gates who didn't go to college, and it suddenly seems like, oh, this is a pretty good alternative when people, especially when people get concerned about debt. But the fact is, it pays. Um, starting to talk about college is one of those things that, it's sort of the elephant in the room, right? Where's the principal? I mean, it really is one of those topics that you feel, you don't want to make your kids stressed out, you don't want to talk about it because it's very stressful, but starting to talk at the end of eighth grade, the beginning of ninth grade is important, and I would argue a de-stressor. I think that talking about and looking, and in my book I have a whole chapter actually devoted just to education, um, and looking at if you think you might be eligible for financial aid, or even if you may not be, you think you may not be, looking at what's called the FAFSA forecaster. It's online, it's Department of Education, it was uh, created by President Obama's in, um, administration. And what it does is give you a sense of how much you'll be expected to pay for college, what your family contribution will be. And the numbers aren't perfect. They might be a couple thousand dollars off. But it does give you a sense. And that will then help you figure out which schools are in the ballpark when it comes to finding a financial safety school for your kid. Um, Two-thirds of kids have to borrow for college. And I think a lot of parents think, if I can avoid it at any cost, I'm going to avoid having my kid borrow. Federal financial student loans have very attractive interest rates, 4%. And when the kids graduate, they can deduct that interest on their credit cards. And studies show when kids have a little skin in the game, whether it's contributing to college or borrowing a little for college, they end up having higher GPAs. So federal student loans are something to keep in mind. And I want to give one, one of my favorite research points. Uh, Alan Kruger, who is an uh, econ economist who's a really brilliant guy, he did a study and basically found that going to the Ivy League or going to the most prestigious college, which is something all parents think about and maybe a buyer two for their children, or at least sometimes think about that, and the kids might feel pressure about that. But he found, um, in a, a large study, found that kids who go to prestigious colleges, the most pre top prestigious schools, uh, versus those who go to regular, very good, excellent state schools, or other schools that aren't as the top five, top ten schools, earned similar salaries. There, there, there was no um, appreciable difference between going to a prestigious school versus a non-prestigious school, except for families that were in the very lower income levels. And they speculate, they don't know exactly why, but they speculate, the study just came out a couple years ago, and they speculate that it has to do with the fact that the connections you might make or the the people you meet in college would have an, a difference for families who didn't have access to that. But for typical, your middle class, upper middle class families, it didn't have an income difference, which I found very interesting and maybe a little, a little bit, you know, helpful to parents to know that. Um, so, one thing to talk to your kids about as they're 
thinking of college, about to go to college, is talk to your kid about graduating in four years. Half of kids, half, 50% of kids, don't graduate in four years. They take longer, five years, six years. And of course, not only does that mean an extra year of tuition, but it also means lost income to that, to that kid, that family. And uh, my final college piece is Mark Kantowitz, who has this great website, Saving for College. He says uh, his rule of thumb for borrowing is don't borrow more than your kid is likely to earn in that first year. So it's a ballpark idea, good to keep in mind. Okay, so we're on to teaching the value of money. One point that has come up again and again is parents say, you know what? My kids just don't seem to get it, right? Like I try to tell them to save, but they're not really getting it and they still want what they want. And I've given a lot of thought to this. Uh, the fact that when I was a kid, and maybe when a lot of us in the room were kids, our parents would pay the bills sitting at the kitchen table, take out that check register, write the checks, um, and we saw that. It was sort of a once a month thing where you know, that would happen, or even a few times a month. Or we'd go to the store with our parents and we'd see them hand over cash, uh, and we'd see that and sort of get it. Okay, cash results in you getting stuff. Um, and maybe some people remember opening a passbook savings account. I say that to people and people get a big smile, you know, often, that they remember that when I opened an account. But today money just doesn't really change hands. You know, we're sw swiping and now we're using Apple Pay and particularly younger kids don't really understand where that money, where, what it is. My favorite story in the book was a friend said she was buying a bunch of juice boxes for her kids and she was with her son at Target and she took out a $20 bill at the register and she handed it over and he's like, mommy, don't use money, use the card. It's so much better. Um, we know, MIT did a study years ago, showed that people spend twice as much when they use plastic, whether it's credit cards or debit cards, than when they use cash. And that's attributed to this phenomenon, the pay of pain of paying. When you have to take out your wallet and start handing over bills, it's a little harder, right? It just, it's a, a, and it's a phenomenon that is known. Um, and I, again, I think of this story of my, my daughter when she headed off to college and I started working on this book. I asked some of her friend's parents, like, tell me what, what's the issue in college? And three moms told me the same story. Uh, two daughters and one son, same story. Calls up the parents and say, oh my gosh, my card has been hacked. And their parents, what do you mean it's been hacked? Yeah, my debit card, there's no money left in my bank account. And, okay, let's go over this. And each mom said, they said, all right, let's think this through. Let's talk about what's on the, the bill. Pull out the bill, let's talk about it. Oh, yeah, I did go to DC to visit friends on the Amtrak train. Or I did eat out with some friends for dinner. And suddenly it's coming back to them, that swiping card actually meant that they were spending money. These are kids who are so smart. These are kids who took like AP Physics, AP Calculus, but they didn't get the fact that money was being siphoned out of this account. So my advice, particularly for younger kids and kids up through, I'd say, high school, is make them use cash. This did not win my daughter a lot of friends in high school, or she felt embarrassed in high school. The first time she said, she wanted to go to the mall with friends. Um, it was sort of like, in Manhattan, there's one sort of small kind of mall-like area. And we we're very overprotective, but we said, okay. But I said to her, you have to take cash. And she's like, but all my friends, they all have credit cards. They have cards, that's their parents' card. And the parents just handed it to them, or debit cards. And we talked about it, and I said, you know, it's so important if I give you $50, this is sort of spending for beginning of the year, school clothes, when she was in high school, and something caught, you know, she has a few items and it costs $54, she's going to have to put something back. And when you hand a kid a card, whether it's a debit card or a credit card, 
they're just charging in, and if it's a little bit over, who's going to say anything? And I think that is something that's fundamentally different about this generation of kids versus our generation of kids. Um, the one thing is, uh, in 2009, President Obama passed the CARD Act. Um, and basically, it said that when you're in college, or you're not in college, you have to be 21 years old in order to get a credit card. Unless you have income, some sort of job, you can prove you have income, or your parent co-signs the card. And I don't know if any of you remember, but when, and I'm probably older than a lot of you, but when we were in college, you can get a credit card no matter what. All you have to do is sign your name. Someone shaking her head, thank you. Uh, I met someone recently who said, yeah, I went to a frat party and I signed my name and I had a credit card. I don't know, you know, here, here I got a credit card for nothing. So that, the law was changed in 2009, which is awesome, but the problem is parents are now co-signing cards for their kids. And if you give a kid an authorized card, a lot of parents say to me, yeah, but I want them to have some sort of credit record. Well, the problem is when you give a kid an authorized credit card, first off, sometimes it doesn't even help them build credit. And often, if the kid gets into trouble with that card, it will hurt your credit score. And I've already met half a dozen parents who told me, yeah, I did that one. I gave my kid a credit card, and then trouble occurred, and it hurt their credit score. So that's one to be aware of, certainly. And it's interesting, millennials today, kids uh, 20s, early 30s, have much less credit card debt than Gen Xers or baby boomers had when they were in their 20s. Um, and people say, oh, maybe it's because they see their parent, they saw the financial crisis, they saw parents losing mortgages, they saw all kinds of issues with credit. But I think also a lot of it does have to do with this credit act, because a lot of parents aren't co-signing. It's a problem when they do, but a lot of parents aren't, and I think that's a good thing. I think a lot of parents say to me, but oh, I need my kid to have a credit report when they graduate and they need some sort of credit record so they can, but the truth is you don't need a credit record freshman year in college or even sophomore year in college. And believe me, having two kids, there's a lot of pressure in college, as anybody knows uh, who has kids, or there are a lot of challenges, whether it's doing your laundry or living with a roommate, as we were told. And I think it's, it's important to make sure not to talk to your kid really emphatically about credit and wait until they're maybe a junior, junior in college or even a senior. And even beyond, it's not that hard to get a credit card anymore, but once you mess up, just once, it will stay on the credit report for seven years. And explaining that to kids is something we don't do, I think, enough but it's an important one. Six is work. Work is good. It's always good to work. I had four jobs. I worked as a, um, at a catering hall. I worked in a pharmacy. I worked at a diner where I didn't even know how to make change. Here I was uh, you know, in high school, and my dad's like, no, you count up. You don't have to subtract it in your head. So that was a good lesson. Working is great. It gives us all kinds of experience. And there are a lot of books that have been come out in the last few years, which I actually really like that talk about kids are pampered, we baby kids, we should let them work. And while that is important, and I agree, when I looked at the research, um, Department of Labor Statistics did a study and found when kids in high school work more than 12 hours a week, that has an impact on the amount of time they have to do their homework on average, and that in, as a result, lowers their grades. So that 12-hour, 13-hour mark seems to be a, uh, a number that you want to be careful in working less than that could actually maybe even boost their GPA a tiny bit, maybe making them more efficient. But you don't want them to work too much more than that if you can help it. Now, of course, a lot of kids have to work to help support their family, but if that's an option, it's a good thing to think about. Um, but I really do think it's important to have a kid work in the summer. Over the summertime, that's not, that homework is not an issue, and that's a good one. And frankly, 
more and more we're hearing about how colleges want to see kids have real experiences and authentic experiences that they, they are able to talk about um, and write about. And I've kind of uh, been noticing how that does make a difference in college, however. If your child works, um, as long as it's under 20 hours, they definitely have a boost on average to GPA, but it has to be an on-campus job. And maybe that's because your child is more engaged in the community or it gives them an activity to sort of keep them focused. But on-campus jobs for college students are something that actually end up with giving, uh, resulting in higher GPAs for kids. Um, and of course, the very uh, often talked about topic of grit, tenacity. And I have a chapter in my book about working and the importance of work and how we found uh, Angela Duckworth great uh, professor from University of Pennsylvania, talks and writes about and has studied the issue of grit and that at the end of the day when they look at all these different traits that someone might have, including intelligence, the number one is hard work and eye on the prize and that tenacity. So I think that is something that talking to kids of all ages uh, is a good one to remind them. Seven is giving. Just I wanted to give you a few quick ones. Um, I think when we have children, particularly young children, um, one of story that really spoke to me was a friend after uh, Hurricane Sandy happened on the East Coast. Uh, she was gathering food and everybody was sort of mobilizing as, uh, um, to help our neighbors. And she was packing up food and her daughter said, wait, you're not gonna give them my peanut butter, are you? And the mom's like mortified, shocked, what do you mean? Like, we're gonna pack together. She's like, but this is an eight-year-old. Do not take my peanut butter, mom, because that is something that really means a lot to me. And the mother said to me, she was embarrassed to tell me, and it was sort of a, 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 a shocking experience for her. But the idea that our kids um, might feel that way is, developmentally appropriate, and I think it really speaks to the idea of talking about why giving is important, and that's why I have a chapter on it, talking about how this is a family value. This is something we do. Um, for younger kids, giving time, not money, is really been shown to be something that has a much bigger impact on them. You know, keeping it real and local, um, something like birthday bud, Every time it's your child's birthday every year, there's an organization where they will give and your child can donate money to give another child who can't get a birthday present a birthday present. Um, or a, uh, someone I know had a rule every time in her family she got something new, whether it was a blouse or a pair of shoes, they would have to give one of those same objects, one of those same items away. And that kind of... Um, uh, concept, uh, whether it's in your family and the sort of standard for young kids, a sh uh, saving, spending, and sharing jar, always putting a third of that money, you put a third to save, a third for the future, and a third to um, give away, or charitable matching, or socially conscious investing, um, which I am definitely in favor of, but making sure the expenses on those funds, um, there are a couple of uh, great socially conscious index funds that I recommend. Um, and then organizations that have small contributions, like Heifer International or um, Adopt an Acre, which are great groups that allow for a small amount of money, um, or Pencils for Promise, for a small amount of money, you can give uh, a cow for, for a different country or pencils for kids who don't have it. And those kind of groups I found for children really have such a clear impact for them. And finally, uh, my last point is talking. Uh, we want to talk to our kids about money. We don't want to lie. Um, the most uh, common thing to do is to go into a store with your kids and when they say they want something, say, I don't have my wallet on me or I don't really have any money on me. How many people have done that? I mean, that's something that we all do from time to time. But then they see you take your card and buy a coffee and you're completely busted. 
they know that, wait a second, you just said you don't have money, but you just bought something with a plastic card. Um, don't overshare about money. You don't have to uh, tell your kids what your income is when they're younger. You don't have to tell your kids how worried you are about paying for college. That could stress them out. Or talk to your kids about how much money is in your 401k, but the market went down and you're really concerned about it. There's a lot of topics that we can not share too much. Um, one of the uh, most surprising um, facts that I found in researching this book was the fact that parents talk to girls in 2016, the study was done by T. Rowe Price. They talked to girls less than they talked to boys about money and particularly investing. And I think it's not surprising if you look at women versus men and retirement savings. Um, for all kinds of reasons, including the pay gap, women have much less in their retirement savings than men have in theirs. But I really think that part of that has to do with the fact that we're just not talking to girls. We're not explaining in the same way we do to boys. Um, I had someone come to my office the other day, and he's a very progressive guy and started this amazing organization to help children. And when he, he came in, he said, you know, I read that paragraph in your book, and I thought, wait a second, I have a girl and a boy, and I realized I always tease my daughter about how she loves to shop. But when it comes to my son, we talk about the stock market and how it's doing. So I think being aware of that, even in now 2017, is an important thing. Um, and I think the notion of not expecting your kids to have money skills just because you give them money is one of the biggest takeaways for me um, in that it feels like driver's ed. If you put your kid in a car and you never taught them and they never had a lesson, how is that going to work out? And I think the same is true for money um, when it comes to talking. Um, I talk about this in our family a lot simply because it's what I've done my whole adult life. And my kids have often come to my talk. And the day I thought maybe I'd talk about it too much is when my son, Adam, who's 18 now, we're putting him to bed. Actually, my husband was putting him into bed. And he looked up, and my husband's like, Daddy, I have to ask you a question. My husband thought, ah, oh, like, where are babies from? What's the meaning of life? And he's like, how do I get higher compound interest? <laughs> and my husband's like, ask mommy. I don't want to talk about it. And so I came in and told him. And, um, and when I worked on Sesame Street to teach Elmo about money, which was by far the most fun thing, what they, the Sesame Street workshop did um, a research, an impact study after the show that was um, on a, um, it was distributed both online and they were able to test a group of people who watched the show with their kids and sat and talked about the topics and were given materials to discuss with their kids, little kids, you know, four or five year olds, and another group who didn't. And they found the people who watched the show and talked about it with their kids, not only did their kids get something out of it, but the parents actually saved more money. So there was a comparison and the notion that when you're teaching your kids, you're also teaching yourself. Um, and I just wanted to wrap up and start taking questions. The correlation between, and this is something, my dad, who's 87, uh, when I was giving a talk, he stood up and he's, he sort of made a little speech, and I wrote down exactly what he said, that the correlation between what you do now and what your kid's lifestyle will be is critical. Um, when I was younger, my dad, he's a, he was a principal, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom, and he loves to tell the story. It was 1969, and he came home and said to my mom, Shirley, my dad is Harold, and he, he said, Shirley, we have to put, we're able to put 50% of our income into a retirement savings plan. New York City introduced this plan, and he was all excited, and my mom said, Harold, what are you, crazy? We have three kids, we have a mortgage. How can I put half of my salary here in $30,000? How can I put half of it away um, when we have three kids? 
And she said, we can't afford it. And my dad said, we can't afford not to do it. And that kind of discussion and talk about money was so prevalent for me. And two final quick stories about my parents. One, I realized very recently, mom passed away this summer. Um, and I thought about her, and I was like, wow, she was the original arbitrager. She was the original arbitrager in that she was a stay-at-home mom, but she would only shop for things at Walbaum's grocery store if it was triple coupon day. So you get 10% off on, say, uh, toweling, paper towel. And she actually, you know what, we didn't even use paper towels. She thought that was sort of too luxurious. We used uh, cloth towels. But if it were tuna fish, she would buy, she would, when it was a sale, she would only buy it when it's triple coupon day, 30% off and then she would buy it in bulk. So we would have like literally 100 cans of tuna fish in our basement because you got such a big discount from it. And then you'd get coupons for shopping in the supermarket and she would use those coupons to get glassware and plates. It was sort of free uh, like trading stamps so you'd use for glassware and plates. And I realized just recently that Wallbaums, the supermarket, was paying my mom to shop there. That, that her ability to sort of think through all these possibilities is something that I think um, really had an impact on me. And my final one is my dad, who is 87, still walks around his, now it's a food emporium, and passes out, he asked me to make flyers about my book. He passes them out to clerks, and if a clerk is nice, he'll give a clerk a, you know, a flyer, and if he really likes someone, he'll give them actually a copy of my book which is probably why it's doing so well, and, um, truth be told. And he would give them a, a copy of the book, and he would say that often, not only did he get the freshest soy milk in the back, because they liked my dad for giving them the book, but they would say, thank you for teaching me the secrets. I didn't grow up hearing about this. And it meant so much to him as an educator, and also meant so much to me, and I realized, that's why I decided to write this book, and I look forward to sharing these secrets with all of you. Um, and I also look forward to meeting you all at the book signing. So thank you, thank you so much.